Hello and welcome to another episode. Today we start with the topic, I shamefully bought Twitter blue. If you go to my Twitter, you'll notice that I have the blue check mark again. So the reason is to upload this video, even in 1080p as I did, it required me to get Twitter blue, else the video would have been too long and too large. I could have worked with reducing the size further, but I couldn't reduce the length of the video. So I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll give Mr. Elon Musk, whatever it is, 13 Australian dollars to get Twitter blue just for this video. And then I'll cancel it immediately. And so I upload the video and cancel the subscription immediately. And I was like, wait, so does that mean I'm still going to get the blue check mark for a month? Because I don't really want that. And so I looked in the FAQ and it's like, you cannot remove the check mark under any circumstances. If you've paid, it's there, deal with it. I was like, oh, that's garbage. And it even says specifically, even if you cancel your membership, you will get Twitter blue. I was like, oh, dang. And as I've said before, if Twitter blue provided enough value and didn't fill me with a sense of shame for having it, I'd pay for it. There's always going to be some amount of value. Like, I know what it would have to be. But understand, while I do not like Twitter blue, I do not like what's become of Twitter, I will 100% get it if the value is there high enough. It is clearly not there. You will shame me? Hey, I'm in the social media game. The biz. If anyone should be paying for it, it's me. But it's, uh, they massacred my boy, my Twitter. They massacred it. Still salty. Steam starts banning accounts associated with CSGO gambling. So previously in another ramble, we talked about how gambling and uh, the skin economy and stuff on CSGO is bigger than ever. And we speculated about whether or not Valve would actually do something about this, considering that it's getting big again. And the last time it got really big, they did something. And so apparently they have done something. Zipple, he's big in the uh, skin CSGO scene. I know of him largely through Jesus, but he uh, writes this. Many accounts connected to CSGO gambling sites have been banned in what honestly appears to be permanent. Like we're talking like many, many, many millions of dollars worth of skins have now been banned on these accounts, inaccessible. You can't get them off, you can't trade them, then you can't use them. Potentially like one of a kind items and stuff just gone. My thoughts are thread. As I have said multiple times, trading on gambling sites obviously involves an increased risk as opposed to regular marketplaces. This is not just people like gambling on these sites, I think, but people who like get skins and then I guess sell them to the gambling sites or whatever. Since I started buying on Twitter in 2019, we saw a crazy influx of new cash traders appearing, buying at rates that were hard to compete with. To be clear, normal cash traders are people who, because you normally can't trade your CSGO skins for real money, what they do is they say, I'll be like the middleman where I'll give you 80% of what the skin is worth on the secondary market, and then you'll be happy with that money, and I'll do all the legwork to find a specific buyer for this item. Because if you don't use a middleman, there's no real official systems, like you can just get completely scammed. Like you send the item and they don't give you the money, that kind of stuff. You could call it maybe a shadow economy of CSGO. All of these accounts offered such rates as they were being paid way above 100% of the value on gambling sites. I think every person supplying gambling sites must have been aware of the risk involved, but decided to do it as it's obviously very profitable and Valve have not really intervened on a larger scale in a long time. Even allowing CSGO roll at a major, various gambling sites were sponsoring different CSGO teams, basically. You gamble site suppliers that appear a bit shady, but you also have traders with companies that, to my knowledge, are running things by the book. However, just capitalizing on the profitability that is involved in setting skins there, albeit the risk it inevitably holds. Conclusively, it's not really shocking to me that they decided to crack down on this, as it might be hard for Valve to justify looking the other way, especially long term. However, a few select people have definitely been undeservingly hit by this, for instance, whoever that is. Who, to the best of my knowledge, is a niche trader that does not even have liquids to supply to these sites, nor did he use them. I obviously hope that Valve will be sensible enough to spend a bit of time reevaluating the bans case by case and not just shut down appeals. As there are definitely instances of some traders that have been unfortunate to go down for no reason whatsoever. This is still to the best of my knowledge, very rare occurrences, so I don't think there is any reason for widespread panic by the general community. These third party reselling stuff, like it's always going to exist if there is no first party option to sell skins. And those skins have some hypothetical real world value, right? In the same way that WoW Gold was, uh, always a thing since WoW first came to be. I find all this stuff very fascinating, even while uh, the morality of a lot of what goes on, the gambling sites, the random nature of the loot boxes, the actual act of being the middleman for these transactions, it's all various shades of terrible to gray, potentially okay <laughs> kind of things. Very interesting nonetheless. Are password requirements going too far? 
So this was something that I actually saw first on TikTok, but it's been put in my rambles, so I'll mention it. It's called the password game. You've perhaps seen my rants where I'm like, I hate it how complicated passwords are getting. And that like to brute force a password might take an entire year, but it doesn't matter. They'll still require you to put like 57 symbols in the middle and whatnot. When traditionally how these passwords are gotten is like social engineering stuff or directly getting them, not brute forcing them, which is the only method that having a really complicated password uh, protects you against. But this is the password game. Apparently it puts this to a whole new level. So let's say I make my password pizza pie. Your password must include a number, one. Your password must include a special character, star. The digits in your password must add up to 25. So we'll do 10, 18, 25. Your password must include a month of the year, March. Your password must include one of our sponsors, Shell. Wait, no, I could have done Pepsi. Wait, Pepsi, I'm sorry. Whew. The Roman numerals in your password must multiply to 35. Isn't M like 50? You want to type VVII? Is that good? What's M? Wait, we go, make this April. Wait, this is 35? Okay, good enough. Okay. Do this capture. This, this, this. Okay. Oh, but now that I've done the capture, which is 7Y242X4, that ruins that my numbers no longer add up to 25. So this is 13. So I just got to remove some numbers. Wait, so this is now nine and two. There we go, okay. Your password must include today's Wordle answer. What? Apparently this gets really, really complicated. And like, it's like, it must include like the 10th line on this particular Wikipedia page. And it just goes on and on and on and on. Oh, the answer's Diner, someone said in chat. Okay, now I'll continue. But, but now the Roman numerals are screwed up. I don't know, I don't know Roman numerals chat. So what's D in Roman numerals? Oh, j just make them lowercase. Oh, I see, okay. Okay, there we go. Your password must include two letter symbol from the periodic table. B-A? I know that from Breaking Bad. Your password must include a current phase of the moon as an emoji. Fuck off. This is coming. Oh, I could use AU too. But this is what I mean. And you can go forever with this. I'm done. I'm done. But very funny site. I guess it kind of builds off the Wordle concept. Oh, there's actually many Wordle clones out. But I, this is a very interesting one to me. So if you're interested in this, check it out. See how far you can get. Before, more like me, you get frustrated and just can't do it anymore. Are movies just like YouTube videos? So I put this on my community post, and it may be weird to be that I posted this, but I want to explain why. Movies are just YouTube videos with more effort and bigger budgets. So for most of my life, I didn't really know how movies were made, how the editing process was done. Once upon a time, they had actual reels of film, and you cut it together in, in the reels or whatever, like an actual physical film. I didn't know how all that worked. It is way above my head. But one day, I happened to see an edit for a movie. It was an Adobe Premiere. It looked like just a timeline that I myself make now. A bit more complicated, obviously, because you're doing all the sound effects and stuff. But it looked like a similar timeline to my video for the cute anime voices for Prologue, where I had to do all the sound effects and stuff. And I looked at this and I'm like, so movies are just YouTube videos, but with more effort and bigger budgets. There's no real difference there. It's the same process of getting the footage, getting sound effects, getting all voices and stuff, putting it in the timeline, cutting it up, and then working on a timeline like I would with a, any of my projects. And that was a weird experience for me. And I was like, well, obviously that's it. What did I think they were doing? But I just never really made that connection. I just assumed that it must be a fundamentally alien process or something that I just don't know anything about because I'm not in the movie industry. But looking, I'm like, this, this is just what I do. It's just editing. Editing is editing. It kind of removed a bit of that movie magic for me in a way. <laughs> This is very different from me saying that I could make a big budget, high effort movie or something. Because obviously looking at those timelines, it's like, ugh, that would take fucking years, potentially, for me to do. But it is fundamentally the same process. Twitch is age restricting my streams to 18 plus. I want your feedback on something. Everyone in the stream right now, not necessarily people in the future. How many of you are under the age of 18 and receive this when you go to my stream? So Flynn says, huh? I'm 17 and can't watch your stream. Not blaming you, of course, but Twitch, come on, dude. I don't think your stream is 18 plus. It says, just a second. Dark Fight use content is intended for certain audiences. It may contain mature rated game. Due to your age and or region, you cannot access this content. I asked him, really? It's restricted to above 18? And he's like, seems like it. It must have been recent because I refreshed your stream and then saw this. How many of you are under the age of 17? Or rather, have accounts that say you're under 18? Lambo is and he got it. So apparently there's a bunch of people that are under 18 here. 
There's two different types of pop-ups chat. One is the one where you can click and say, I'm fine with mature content. This one, he's saying he couldn't get into the stream. And if you're here, you didn't get this one. <laughs> it could be because of region, yes. It might be in whatever region this person's in. They're specifically restricted for mature rated games to being 18 plus. It'd be weird to me though. A game has to be pretty damn brutal for it to be uh, like R rated or whatever. Again, it just depends on the region, I suppose. Very strange. But I would think if everyone under 18 was restricted, that there'd be enough of you not restricted that I'd probably notice in my numbers, right? And I'd be, be receiving far more messages than just, than just one guy. So it's either this was broken or it's just restricted to a particular region. Very strange. Is my merch store doing poorly? I want to see how my merch sales are doing. So I've done 186 sales for $618. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've had eight weeks of this store existing. And the last couple of weeks, I've gotten like 10 sales. So it's not amazing. Is this more than my previous store? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't really follow the previous store all that much. But you'd assume so, because this would be advertised less, right? Although I suppose I'm not advertising on my Twitch, which maybe matters more. The next GTA Chaos will have an ad in it for my merch. And it tells people they can make their own stuff and stuff. So we'll see how that works. But uh, I hope everyone in, who bought stuff enjoyed this stuff. Advertise quick. Yo, bro. Shipping globally. You can make your own stuff. I've got like 180 designs and stuff. It's super cool. Check it out. You should check out this new speedrun documentary. So there's a video that I want to talk about. It's called The History of Medieval World Records. I think Pap probably made a mistake not having speedrun in the title. I think that probably does matter because YouTube does push topics as well as make connections between viewers, but whatever. It's been out for a day. It only has 1600 views, but the video is two hours long. Now, I do like a good speedrun world record documentary. I don't watch that many, but I clicked on this one and I was like, I'll just intermittently watch this while I'm working. And I think I like just got hooked into it quickly and I just watched the entire thing. <laughs> I'm trying to communicate how good I think this video is. I knew nothing about medieval. I have never seen a medieval speedrun, but the video was still very interesting to me, which is a hard thing to do. Trying to sell an entirely alien thing to a person who knows nothing about what you're trying to cover. But it saddens me to see videos like this having so few views. I really hope it blows up. He doesn't release that many videos. And as I say, this video is two hours long and I think it's masterfully crafted. So if you do like speedrun documentaries, or especially if you have an interest in medieval, feel free to go watch this video. Some people ask me why I don't link the video to you guys, either when I'm live streaming or under the video itself. And the reason for this is I've become scared of like screwing a small content creator's algorithm in a way. Like all of you guys aren't going to be interested in this kind of content. So if I make it too readily accessible, a lot of you may go over there, watch like a minute, and then leave. And that might hurt the video. Or, like, it's even possible hypothetically, because it's going to end up on my Rambles channel, which has nothing to do with speedrunning, that if it's too easily accessible, then if enough of you people go over there, it will recommend that video to everyone who watches my Rambles. And again, that might not be the target audience for these videos. So, I want to inform you about the video's existence, but only go look it up if you actually want to watch it. It's a little bit different than, say, like, like on my main channel, if I do GTA Guesser with another GTA content creator, I'm not going to fuck up their channel's algorithm or, or whatever, or, or present their videos potentially just to people who won't like it, because it's the same sort of thing. But obviously, the Rambles channel and this live stream, it's not a medieval speedrun sort of thing. But yeah, so do check this guy out. He seems to make good videos, seems to be a good dude. And uh, yeah, YouTube is mostly just rags to rags nowadays. So much great stuff is buried by the algorithm. Requires a half decade of fine tuning to find a lot of good stuff. I think it's just more that it's a really hard job categorizing hundreds of millions of videos and trying to find the most efficient way to get those videos to viewers who actually want to watch them. Like when you go to YouTube, not even you specifically know what you want to watch. A machine is trying to figure that out for you and present you something that you might watch. But at any given time, there are effectively hundreds of thousands of videos that if they were shown to you and you knew what was in them, you'd want to watch them. That's just the nature of content, right? But presenting something to you where you are convinced just by looking at it that you might get some value by watching it is a much harder task. Like if we stopped time and had you look at all 800, 900, whatever million videos on YouTube, you'd find endless things that you want to watch, but you don't, you don't want to spend that time. In the last couple of weeks, I've been recommended a lot of small creators with videos with less than 5k total views, and those aren't recently uploaded ones. I get recommended such people all the time. I don't know if it's necessarily changed a lot, but maybe over the last year, they've been doing it a bit more. Thinking about it, 
it's probably a higher portion of people under 10k subs that I've been watching recently. Pap isn't a good example though, because he's in a Discord with me and uh, other speedrun content creators. Maybe I shouldn't be in there anymore, but whatever. <laughs> Please don't kick me out. <laughs> but um, yeah, they're, they're, they'll put their videos in there for us to watch, and so I watched it. My streams are filled with lurkers. A while ago, I signed up to this thing called Stream B that is said to give you additional analytics about your live stream. It did, it was fairly interesting, but then I, I forgot about it and I didn't use it really all that much. But now they've started sending out emails that tell you more minute stats related to your streams. So, good job, your last stream was great. Overall rating, 9 out of 10, which is not that great, but well, it looks pretty great here though. But So like it's showing me like my growth in viewers over time compared to my average. Apparently I'm averaging like 800. Which is, of course, the, the balance between my Binding of Isaac streams, which is like 600, and GTA, which is like 1,200. But interestingly, it says down here, percent of viewers that were chatters, and it's 20%. Now, the reason why this was interesting to me was because for the longest time, even when I was a small creator, I would hear people say all the time, like, only 20% of viewers ever speak. And I, I had no idea where that name, number came from. And I don't think it was in the back end of Twitch. And so seeing it here consistently, like every stream, it's about 20% of people. Maybe 21%, maybe 19%, but it's about 20% of people speak. I wonder why that is. Well, it can't be consistent across all of YouTube, right? There must be some streams that inspire people to chat more. But as I often say, like a lot of what Twitch is, is just like background noise. Obviously, if you're not talking in chat, it doesn't mean you aren't watching the stream, but a significant portion of people who watch Twitch just turn it on for background noise while they're doing other stuff. This out of context channel is very bizarre. So I thought I was fairly creative when I thought to myself, hey, I make a bunch of weird sounds and say a bunch of weird things out of context. I should just make my own channel dedicated exclusively to that idea. Like even just like five second clips of me just saying weird stuff. But it turns out I've now seen two of them that other people obviously had this idea first. I'm not a special snowflake. Someone showed me this one from Jack Sucks at Life. And it's just less than 10 second videos. Please get back to me, Jerome. I miss you. That probably meant something to someone, but I have no idea what that means. But obviously looking at this channel, I am not sure how much value this really has. These videos aren't getting a lot of views, because obviously really, really short videos do not get much of a push in the algorithm at all anymore. So looking at this guy not succeeding with this, I'm like, ah, it's probably too much effort to uh, do this myself. But maybe one day, who knows? He has like 15 accounts. Yeah, I'm kind of moving that way myself now, <laughs> aren't I? Answering your most interesting questions. What do you call fish fingers in Australia? In the US, I believe they're called fish sticks. I believe we call them fish fingers as well. For those who don't know, fish fingers are like a bar of fish that is crumbed around it. I'm assuming they use like the lowest quality fish. I mean, even the bits of fish that they don't want to use elsewhere or something. And, and so you can buy like fish fingers for ridiculously low prices. So all kids grow up eating fish fingers because they cost effective way to feed kids. And uh, you put like lemon on top of them, tastes nice. Especially because like the heat gets trapped in the crumb. And so like when you cut into it, like steam pours out and it's just like, oh, love them as a kid. Where do you garner the most amount of viewers on YouTube or on Twitch? It's not even comparable. It's YouTube. I mean, I can do a poll right now, even on Twitch. Where did you find me first? YouTube, Twitch, other. So other being Reddit, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram. And this is obviously a biased sample because I'm on Twitch right now. This is the, actually the lowest it's been, but based on this current sample, it's 90% YouTube, 8% Twitch, and 2% other. It is a small sample though, because there's only 100 people. But obviously I've just had the most reach on YouTube. My YouTube audience, like the individual unique people who watch me every month is in the millions. I don't min-max Twitch in the way that you really should, if your goal was to get as much out of Twitch as possible, because I just don't think there's a lot to get out of Twitch. You gotta be really high up there in terms of viewership to be getting a constant influx of exposure from the platform itself. As if you watch all my rambles, you would have seen the previous one that when the top English streamer has 10 times the watch time as the 50th English streamer, it's a ridiculous level of top heaviness. That's not something that happens when viewers are just shown a wide selection on the platform and then try a wide selection on the platform and find what they truly enjoy. That's something that happens when the top is shown first and if it satisfies enough, they don't move on. Twitch is a very much so a, everyone starts at the top and then they trickle down unless you get the viewers from elsewhere, which is what I've done, right? But obviously I've made things harder for myself because I, I don't stream 12 hours a day or whatever. I've done nothing to maintain the 
Twitch audience. I haven't worked super hard to make my streams as interesting as possible. I've worked super hard to make my streams as conducive to being edited well for YouTube as possible. How I conduct myself, what I say, when I record, how my stream is segregated. It's all based on making it as consumable for YouTube as possible. I bring people over to Twitch from a YouTube, but of course these people are less likely to be on Twitch to find and watch me so. My stream and my content would look very different if I had a focus on trying to have as many concurrent viewers on Twitch as I could. It's interesting though, doing the most recent giveaway, I didn't consider that there are so many people who watch me on YouTube that have Twitch Prime and don't watch Twitch enough to give people their Twitch Primes. So when I did my giveaway where there's a benefit for your subscribing, I got something like 700, maybe to a thousand Twitch Primes. All these people who just have them but never use Twitch enough to give them away were like, well, I may as well give them and this is an opportunity to do that. And so I may actually make money on this giveaway, which was not the goal. I guess in the future, I'll have to give away more money if this happens again or something. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was actually a thousand, but it was a, it was a lot. Like I, I, I was balancing around like 2000 subs for quite a while and now I'm up to like 3,200. You know what will help YouTube stay dominant over Twitch? Hitting that like and subscribe button. Thank you, and I wish you all the best.